This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. Thanks so much for coming out. Our guest tonight is David Stockman. He is a former congressman, a two-termer from Michigan, south of Grand Rapids, uh, probably best known in the public uh, eye for being Ronald Reagan's first budget director who made the naive, idealistic, and absolutely wonderful mistake of believing that Ronald Reagan wanted to cut the size, scope, and spending of government right. across the board. The what you he wanted to cut. He wouldn't say this. You would. He wanted to cut the welfare warfare state. Right. Welfare part. Yeah. <laughs> and what happened when you were like, okay, uh, and this is before we get into his fantastic book, a, a real stinging critique of Donald Trump, uh, Trump's war on capitalism. Uh, in preparing for this, you, as budget director, you came in and you had to cut $40 billion from a $700 billion budget right. uh, in 1981. To give you a sense of how quaint that is, the defense budget now is above $700 billion. I think we may be approaching that just an in interest on the debt. Sure. But you were scrounging around to find $40 billion to cut. Um, what happened? Well, I think the uh, problem was Ronald Reagan believed in small government profoundly, except for the Pentagon side of the Potomac River. And, uh, you know, he was, uh, he was uh, really a hawk, a real unreformed, unrequited uh, uh, requited, uh, Cold War hawk. The defense budget was about $140 billion when we got there by the time he left. It was 350 billion, massive increase on the theory that the Soviet Union was developing first strike capability. None of that was true. That was the origination of the whole neocon view of the world. That's where all these characters originally uh, got their stake, their start in the process. And so by the time we got to 1988, uh, the defense budget had eaten up and then some all the domestic cuts and uh, the Republicans who were willing to stand up for domestic spending cuts and entitlement reforms and so forth were so demoralized by seeing these massive increases year after year for the Pentagon that they basically threw in the towel and the whole thing was kind of a wipeout. If you want to get the numbers on it just to kind of uh, cap off the point. Uh, when Jimmy Carter left the White House uh, after all those years of big spending by the Democrats, first Carter and then before him, of course, uh, LBJ and Guns and Butter and all the rest, uh, domestic, the domestic uh, budget, non-defense, was 15.4% of GDP. So way up compared to his historically. When Reagan left, it was 153 so he, he made one-tenth of one percent uh, difference, uh, and that's uh, about all we got done. Um, you know, I would recommend everybody read uh, The Triumph of Politics, David's memoir of his time. Uh, the subtitle is called Why the Reagan Revolution Failed, and it is, if you're interested in political economy as well as gossip, uh, this is, <laughs> it's really one of the great memoirs. Um, but the book we're talking about tonight is Trump's War on Politics, and what uh, Trump's uh, war capitalism. on capitalism, excuse me. Yeah. And this, the title says it so well, there isn't even a subtitle. Yeah, yeah. Um, why don't you start by telling us, you know, what was Trump's war on capitalism? He is a businessman. He talked about having the greatest, the biggest, the best economy ever, uh, you know, when he was president and things like that. What's the, what's the essence of Trump's war on capitalism? Well, um, the, the question I think you were getting at is, why did I write it? And uh, the answer is, I had already written three, war, uh, three books <laughs> trying to expose uh, the fact that Donald Trump isn't remotely an economic conservative, doesn't believe in small governments. I don't think he believes in uh, free markets, and certainly he had no affinity whatsoever for sound money or, or fiscal rectitude. So in 2016, I wrote a book called Trump to warn people. In 2018, I wrote another book called Peak Trump uh, to say that I was right. And in 2020, I wrote a third book called Dump Trunk, <laughs> Dump tr Trunk. Uh, and, you know, I figured... Uh, you are starting to sound like the Buffalo Bills yeah, in the yeah, Super Bowl. Yeah. This is yeah, your fourth no, one. No, I was starting to think that, well, the fourth time would be the charm. Right. And my book came out five days before the Iowa primaries, and it was too late. 
<laughs> so, yeah. uh, but there is a bigger point to it, and that is you're n we're never going to get the kind of government I think that all of us believe in, the kind of society, the kind of liberty, the kind of economic prosperity, the kind of market capitalism and so forth, unless there is an honest contest in the process of democratic governance in the United States between one party that more or less lines up as the government party, the party of the st of state, uh, the party of the political class, the bureaucratic class, the apparatchiks in Washington, and there's a second party that represents the hinterlands and all of the impulses that go with us uh, to leave us alone, to tax us less, to spend less, to intervene less, to get out of our way, uh, to allow you know uh, the private uh, society and economy to breathe, so we really need a, a government party uh, contesting with an anti-government party. The problem is today we have a uniparty in terms of the career leadership of the Republican Party in Washington. When I look at McConnell, who's been there 55 years uh, on the government payroll, I can't really tell you know, any difference between him and uh, you know, our senator from New York, uh, the leader on the Democratic side. And so uh, what I think the great danger is that the problems in the United States today in terms of our position in the world, which is a disaster, in terms of our public debt, and we can get into a lot of those numbers in a minute, uh, in terms of a cent rogue central bank that is totally uh, out of control, that uh, if we want to address any of that, then uh, we can't uh, have a continued uh, rule of the uniparty. We need to break it up. But Donald Trump, despite all of his uh, you know, uh, rhetoric and all of his loud, uh, 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 you know, boasting about draining the swamp and being the outsider and coming in uh, to clean up the whole thing is just as much a statist uh, when it comes to all the key issues, and we go through them in the book, uh, as uh, most of the mainstream politicians in Washington. So the last thing we need is not um, you know, a, a fight in 2024 20, uh, uh, between Trump and Biden. It's uh, pointless, it's useless. We need to have a clean break in the Republican Party, blow it up if we have to, and not allow the second party in our democracy to be Trumpified, because if it's Trumpified, then we get more of what we had during the four years that he was there. I've got a lot of data on that, but let me just cap it here with one, and then we can go in, into some of the details. Um, when Trump became, uh, uh, it was sworn in, the public debt, it was 20 trillion already, and it had been swelling rapidly for several decades. When he left, it was close to 28 trillion, so let's just call it 8 trillion in four years. Now, someone might ask, you know, uh, we, when we have numbers like this, just like you were saying, Nick, uh, numbers of this magnitude are almost uh, hard to grasp, uh, to understand, but here's how to understand it. The first eight trillion, equivalent to the eight trillion that Trump uh, racked up in four years, had taken from the, the first day of the Republic to 205 to accrue. That is the first 43 presidents in 216 years generated eight trillion of public debt. Trump replicated that in four years, not only uh, because of uh, you know huge tax cuts that he didn't try to offset with spending, but because of the whole disaster of the uh, pandemic, the COVID, the lockdowns, and uh, six and a half trillion worth of uh, you know bailout and relief and uh, free stuff that uh, came out of the effort to try to tell people, yeah, we're sending everybody home, but don't worry, we'll send you money too. So uh, that, that's the heart of the matter. Anybody that could generate eight trillion uh, in four years of additional public debt equal to the first 43 presidents, and there were some real rascals, obviously, and bad guys uh, in that uh, lineup, including FDR and LBJ and a lot of others in between, uh, th that's, that's the kind of number that grasps you uh, by the collar and tells you, uh, you know, th this guy is part of the uh, swamp. Uh, he's not part of the solution. What, uh, just briefly, what is wrong with running up massive debt, especially if the government, you know, or if the, the United States dollar is still the reserve currency of the world? Um, 
you know, it's a lot of debt, but hey, we can kind of cover it. Just well, briefly. Well, yeah, yeah, I think uh, those are great questions. Uh, someone asked me that in 1970 when I first went to work on Capitol Hill. I ran for Congress in 1976 against the deficit, Jimmy Carter, or I mean the outgoing uh, Ford deficits, which were large. And the question was raised, and here we are, and it's now, uh, you know, 34 trillion and rising, and so uh, maybe it's no problem after all. No, the answer is there are two ways to finance the deficit, both of them bad. The first way is the honest way. You finance it in the bond pits by borrowing out of the private savings stream. The effect of that, though, everybody understood when I was first on Capitol Hill in the 70s and into the early 80s, that when you finance the public debt uh, deficits the honest way, it causes crowding out it forces up interest rates higher and higher because whatever the given uh, supply of savings is at the moment, uh, you know, the, uh, Uncle Sam has the sharpest elbows, gets first call on the money, uh, the crowding out happens, rates go up, that's where we got the famous bond vigilantes and so forth. And that's why actually when we were trying to cut taxes in the early 70s, the uh, what I called the College of Cardinals, the established season Republican leaders in the House, uh, Bob Dole, Senator Domenici, uh, people of uh, Howard Baker, who was the Senate leader, people, that, they said, no, we've got to be careful here because if we finance all of this tax cut uh, with red ink and borrowing, we're going to crowd out private uh, investment. We're going to hear from our car dealers that can't fun, you know, finance uh, their lot. We're going to hear uh, from our home builders that, uh, can't, whose customers can't get mortgages and so, and so forth. So the point is, if you finance it the honest way, you cause crowding out, you get an early reaction economically. You basically uh, suppress productive investment and you shift society's resources to uh, government uh, investment, if you think that's a word, and I don't. Right. <laughs> I think it's an oxymoron. So uh, the other thing about it that's really important to understand without getting too deep into this, but it's why Trump is so bad, is that in the honest way of financing the deficits, which by, by the way, had to be done in the late 70s and early 80s, because Paul Volcker was sitting in the uh, chair at the Fed, and he was not about to monetize the debt. Uh, and as a result, uh, we had an environment in which the political reaction function, if you want to use that kind of term, the feedback, was almost instantaneous and early. Run big deficits, drive up interest rates in the bond pits, those spread to the banking sector, those spread uh, to the hometown car dealers and home builders and uh, SNL bankers and, you know, uh, just regular consumers. Uh, and it causes a political reaction that uh, it tends to uh, create a constituency in the political system in Congress for uh, reining in uh, the, the deficit. That, okay, that's the first way. The second way is to you know, issue all kinds of public paper and have the central bank buy it, okay? And that's called monetization. And that's exactly what we've been doing ever since the late 70s, uh, or late 80s, effectively, after Volcker left. And let me just give you some idea of how much has been monetized. When Greenspan took over, and you remember this is 1987, he was allegedly at one time a great uh, believer in the gold standard and an Ayn Rand <laughs> disciple and a lot of other things. He sort of lost his economic virginity somewhere along the, uh, you know, he was kind of a nerdy. So I think we're paying for the abortion though, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he, he was some kind of nerdy clarinet player who couldn't get the girl, and he decided that um, uh, if he was the toast of the town in Washington, it might work out better, and it actually did. But in any event, uh, the, the balance sheet of the Fed, and this is important to understand, was $200 billion, and this is 1987. So, uh, you know, that's something like 70 years of the Fed's existence. It had taken 70 years to get to 200 billion. And I'm going to talk a lot about the balance sheet of the Fed, and people will say, well, that's what kind of, you know, what does that mean? Why is that such a big deal? The balance sheet of the Fed is simply the track record of how much cumulative money they've seized out of thin air, printed, uh, you know, a fiat credit uh, over time. So we had 200 billion. To, to cut this story short, 
until they be decided that inflation was out of control about a year ago and began to pull back, the, uh, the balance sheet of the Fed had reached $9 trillion. Now, this is in a lifetime. I'm looking out here. I can see probably quite a few people that might have been around in 1987. And uh, we're all here tonight. And you went from $200 billion, uh, you know, uh, to the $9 trillion. That's 45x, 45 times growth in that uh, period of time, uh, several decades, at a point when the GDP was only uh, increasing by 5x. Okay, so when the money printed by the Fed goes up 45 times and the size of the economy goes up five times, you are way, way, way uh, out of kilter, out of skew. Uh, and it is that massive, continuous money printing which monetized all of the debt being created by, uh, you know, a uh, reckless Congress and, and White House that allowed us to continue to run these huge uh, budget deficits year after year, but eventually it catches up with you as well. In other words, you know, there's this famous thing in, um, I think it's Hemingway's book uh, where, uh, you know, he's asked, uh, how did you go, uh, uh, he, one of the characters asked, a lot of, I can see you shaking your head, a lot of people know this one, uh, how did you go bankrupt? And uh, the answer was slowly at first, then of a sudden, <laughs> okay? And uh, what I'm trying to get at here is the uh, honest way to finance the deficit uh, uh, will cause problems very quickly. Uh, what we're uh, doing is the slow way, but we've created massive financial bubbles, massive, um, you know, uh, misallocations of resources, tremendous amounts of speculation uh, that should never happen in a healthy economy and wouldn't happen, and it's permitted this to go on much longer than would be, have been the case if we had done it the honest way. But uh, now, now we're at the point uh, where uh, I think the uh, chickens are coming home to roost because even the Fed has stopped printing money because the inflation was out of control. So to bring it back to Trump, you know, Trump made a big uh, a deal about, uh, you know, caring about the forgotten man, talking about Main Street versus Wall Street, all of that. Your book, you know, makes the case that whatever he's saying, he's actually helping kind of Wall Street or the financial sector far more than, you know, the productive se uh, uh, production sectors and service sectors of the economy. Talk a little bit about his tariffs. Yeah. Uh, tariffs and his immigration policy and the way that that, in the name of helping people, like he's trying to help small producers and is saying, we're going to keep China from dumping cheap products here so you can have your your industry here. Why is that wrong? Well, you know, that's a great question, and there's a huge amount to unpack, and if I get too far off the uh, beaten path here, uh, re re you know, reel me in, and, and we'll get, get to some of the other points. But the, the big irony about Trump is that he was the outsider who was campaigning against the status quo, the establishment, the deep state, uh, you know, the political class, all, and that all made for good rhetoric, and it actually uh, resonated with the public. But when you look at what his policy solutions are, they have nothing to do with draining the swamp. Trump's basic take on why all these people were left high and dry in flyover America uh, and in the Rust Belt and why we lost uh, millions and millions of jobs and why manufacturing has gone to China and elsewhere, his basic take is that this was all due to the... Uh, to the uh, Oper the work of nefarious foreigners, that is uh, foreign governments that were cheating and unfair in their trade practices, uh, e uh, immigrants coming across the border in hordes uh, who were allegedly bloating our welfare state and undermining our economy and undermining our security. That's and always so forth. the great thing, right? Immigrants are simultaneously coming here for welfare and then outworking us. They're yeah, like, yeah. you know, yeah. which, which is it, right? Yeah, but see, the, so the point is you can't, you, you can have the right theme drain the swamp, 
then you better go to the swamp and change the policies, ask what they are that have caused all of this uh, disorder, distress, and failure. And that would have pointed exactly to the Federal Reserve because it's been pro-inflation uh, you know, since the 70s, and then it made inflation official with its 2% target. And it was that pro-inflation policy decade after decade that priced us out of the world market. It's that simple. And I look at one uh, statistic that I've got uh, in the book, which uh, uh, looks at the cumulative increase in unit labor costs over the decades. And that's important because remember what unit labor costs are. It's wage cost increases, benefits and in pay, uh, less productivity. Because if you have wage increases and you have equal uh, productivity gains, then the cost of uh, production doesn't change and uh, you know, a business can uh, go on uh, and expand and thrive without raising its prices. But if wages are increasing dramatically ra more rapidly than productivity because you have a pro-inflation policy being run by the central bank, then over time, unit labor costs get totally out of control. And here's a startling number. From 1970, when we basically you know, flushed sound money down the drain at Camp David in 1971, actually, Nixon, um, from then until uh, the present, unit labor costs in the United States have risen 275%. And as a result of that, we have priced ourselves out of both the services market, because all, all the services have gone to India and other uh, low-wage countries, to say nothing of the merchandise goods market uh, that has gone uh, to Mexico and China and so forth. I have one little uh, thing in the book that give, gives a pretty good example. Uh, you know, IBM was the great monster of the midway at one point in terms of making the computer hardware, which is the modern uh, uh, e economy. Uh, but between 1990 and the present, uh, their employment in, in India has gone from zero to about 180,000, and their employment in the United States has been cut by uh, more than a third. So uh, th that, that's on the services side, to say nothing of what happened to these massive year-in, year-out uh, uh, merchandise trade deficits. Why did that happen? It all happened because the unit labor costs uh, increasing at these rates, it happened because you had a pro-inflation rather than a pro-deflation central bank. And ironically, it happened because Milton Friedman gave uh, Richard Nixon, Tricky Dick, uh, as we all fondly uh, call him, uh, some very bad advice. He said, okay, we're going to uh, unlink the dollar from its uh, uh, base, uh, from its link to gold. Uh, but uh, don't worry about uh, that because the free market will take care of exchange rates. And what that really meant was that if we inflated too much domestically relative to the rest of the world, our exchange rate would go down. All of a sudden, imports would cost a lot more, our exports would be less competitive, and there would be a, a disciplining mechanism, a breaking mechanism that would prevent uh, you know, huge increases in the trade deficit and the offshoring of production. Now, that's what Friedman uh, told uh, Nixon. Now, in theory, he was probably right, but in practice, he was utterly wrong because what happened over the last five decades is all the central banks of the world have engaged in dirty floats. And so there never was a free uh, market in Could exchange. Could you yeah, explain what a dirty float? Uh, is? A dirty float. It, yeah, it sounds kind of uh, intriguing. Actually. Yeah, it sounds kind of intriguing. Uh, but uh, a dirty float basically says rather than let the market clear uh, in terms of the exchange rate between, say, the dollar and the yen, or the dollar and the euro, or the dollar and the uh, you know Mexican uh, peso. Uh, central banks step in and try to peg the, uh, the exchange rate in a way that they, you know, uh, believe, and it's uh, another part of the evil in the world that we're dealing with, sort of Keynesian economics and statist economics and so forth, they believe if they peg their uh, exchange rates low, it'll help their export factories, uh, it'll help uh, jobs, it'll help prosperity, they can export more to the rest of the world. Uh, and so uh, that's called mercantilism. And what the Fed has done after 1971 is spread a massive monetary disease in the world 
called mercantilist uh, monetary policy. And uh, as a result of that, and I've got a lot of examples in the book of why we've lost so much uh, production and jobs to Mexico, uh, to say nothing of uh, uh, China, is basically because the Fed said it's okay to manipulate your currency, it's okay uh, to uh, increase uh, your domestic money supply at uh, huge unsustainable rates because we're doing the same thing here. And so as we flooded the world with uh, fiat dollars as the Fed's balance sheet went, as I said, just in that short period of time from 200 billion to 9 trillion, the rest of the world, these other central banks, uh, but particularly the Asian ones, and also the Persian Gulf oil, uh, petro uh, bank, uh, central banks, bought in dollars hand over fist, but the, the secret of that whole thing is when they were buying dollars to keep their exchange rate uh, from rising, they were basically uh, uh, creating, their, uh, selling their own currency to the domestic market. Uh, in other words, the Fed was exporting infl inflation and the other central banks reciprocated by buying up the dollars and inflating their own money supplies. Now, why am I going into all this? Because that meant that what Friedman said was the automatic adjustment mechanism of the free market and exchange rates was uh, short-circuited. Uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, blocked. And so the adjustment never came, and as a result, from 1974 onward, we have not had one year of a, a trade surplus, and it's gotten worse and worse, and over the period of time, it was 15 trillion of cumulative trade uh, uh, deficits. And if you even throw in the, the uh, surplus on current, on services that we have in the world, it's still 11 trillion over the last 40 years. Well, why, is 11 trillion a big number? Well, if you put it in today's purchasing power, it's 20 trillion. Uh, and so therefore, basically, we have, uh, uh, you know, borrowed 20 trillion from the rest of the world to keep this whole game going. So that, that's why, um, you know, this is how we got into the mess uh, on trade. And this is why uh, Trump, as I say in the book, uh, had it uh, totally upside down. The problem was, you know, he would tell you, listen to the speeches, it's these nefarious evildoers in the trade, uh, U.S. Trade uh, Administration or in the Commerce Department or, uh, you know, uh, lobbyists sneak, uh, sneaking around uh, the banks of the Potomac that made bad trade deals uh, and gave away the store uh, with all of our competitors. And that's why we're in such a big uh, mess and that if you put a guy who really knows how to negotiate and, for instance, not pay his bills, which uh, was one of his uh, negotiating techniques, if you put some, a tough guy like me in the uh, Oval Office, I'll negotiate good trade deals, and before you know it, everything is going to be better. Well, he negotiated NAFTA, as you all remember, and there's a lot of hoopla about that. Basically, if you look at it, it just got a new name. Nothing changed. And secondly, if you look at what happened to the deficit with Mexico, it doubled <laughs> after, uh, you know. And the, is the, that a bad thing, though? I mean, he did, he renegotiated NAFTA, and we kind of, I guess, got worse terms on some level, but we got more stuff cheaply. Why, well, why yes, but, you know, the I, I think that's true. But there is a free trade position that says, don't worry, you know, this, there's a certain kind of libertarian free market, free trade, that, that ignores uh, the monetary side of this. Right. And so it says, well, and th there is this point, and I used to make it, uh, and I think half of it's valid, the other half isn't. The point we used to make in the 70s and 80s was, well, if other uh, countries are stupid enough to fill their harbors with rocks, you know, you know, it's sort of figuratively uh, stop trade. Uh, well, why should we uh, reciprocate and be as stupid as they are? And so therefore, if they want to subsidize their exports like the Chinese or others, uh, uh, well, more, more power to them because they're basically transferring wealth to our consumers. Uh, uh, domestic welfare uh, is better off, and so that's fine. 
Well, that's half of the equation. But the other half of the equation is that when you have a net export uh, imbalance of 20 trillion over a period of time, you have exported a huge amount of your production, productive base to the rest of the world. And unless you can keep borrowing at larger, higher and higher rates, that isn't sustainable as an economic matter first. But as a political matter, and this is the point, and you may think it sounds a little flippant, but I don't think it is. I think that Milton Friedman was the godfather of Donald Trump because Milton Friedman basically told Nixon, uh, sever the link to gold, and I'm a gold standard man, I think you might have uh, noticed that, uh, and we don't need to worry about uh, the uh, you know, ancient relic or barbarous relic or whatever uh, Keynes called it, uh, because we have a market, uh, a free market that'll set the exchange rates right. Well, he was wrong about that, we exported massive amounts of our industrial base, and I'll give one statistic on this that I think is uh, uh, telling. We ma exported massive amounts of our industrial base. We created a burned out zone in much of the Rust Belt, the upper Midwest, uh, 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 Pennsylvania, uh, New England was long gone. Um, I was from the auto state of Michigan and you know that, that was totally burned out. But where did, uh, you know, where did Trump get elected in 2016? On the margin, he got elected in the Rust Belt precincts of Pennsylvania, uh, of Michigan, of Wisconsin, of Iowa, uh, in all the places that got left behind because we had an unsustainable uh, you know, uh, e set of economics with the rest of the world, and it was caused by the central bank that uh, Friedman was willing to uh, let free. Now, of course, Friedman thought that all of the central bankers, that is, the members of the Fed, would be just like him. They would be Milton Friedman clones, and they would be very punctilious about, you know, the rate at which they were expanding uh, Fed credit, and he had all kinds of rules of thumb and so forth. But of course, th that was a, uh, you know, that was a pipe dream. That was naive. The people that get appointed to the Fed are basically uh, there to do the business either of Wall Street, of Washington politicians, uh, or Wall Street speculators. And yeah. uh, that's essentially so what we've I, got. I feel a little bit bad because the last one of these recent speakies who we had was with the biographer of Milton Friedman, and we were generally saying nice things about him. So <laughs> I feel like we're kind of whispering. Uh, but uh, your point Can is I just uh, say, yeah, say one sure. thing? Okay. I'm not really trying to trash Milton yeah. Friedman because he's a great hero. Yeah, I thought it was Trump's war on capitalism, yeah, yeah. So not Friedman. Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, he was, in terms of free markets and the understanding the, the rudiments of a free society, you can't beat uh, Milton Friedman. But the problem is he had a view of central banking and a view of the Federal Reserve that I think was totally wrong and that uh, became uh, the, uh, you know, the fulcrum for all of these things that happened. One of uh, the since. other things you talk about, I mean, because this, uh, all of the, certainly all the problems with the Federal Reserve or the central bank predate Trump. And, uh, you know, a fascinating thing that you pull together in the book is you Note, from 1947 to 2000, real growth, uh, annual economic growth, averaged 2.45%. Um, since then, it was under Bush, it was nine-tenths of a percent. Obama, basically 1%. Trump, 1%. So, you know, whatever has been going on in terms of economic growth has been bad for a while. But you talk a lot about how TARP, at the end of the Bush administration and the beginning of the Obama one, mm -hmm. handouts to uh, automakers, I mean, locked them yeah. into place. So could you talk a little bit about how Trump, you know, and then Trump did something similar with COVID, but is part of the problem when you talk about the, the Midwest or the Rust Belt that these parts of the, uh, these parts of the American economy haven't been really, I, you know, they end up owning uh, creative destruction. Like they just, they they get wiped out, but they're not allowed to change and adapt because they get various kinds of programs that are designed to help them kind of make it through to the next paycheck or something like that. Yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of cr the, the, the problem of crony capitalism. I, uh, for anybody that might be interested, I wrote a 640 page book <laughs> called, uh, you know, uh, on that whole topic that was uh, uh, released in 2013. 
but I think you know the the issue uh, that that we need to find a way to understand is that everything goes back to central banking. And when the central bank makes it so easy to borrow money uh, and we end up with a economy that had, when Greenspan uh, left or got there, there was about 10 trillion of total debt on the economy, public and private. This is household, business, government, finance. Okay, and that was less than 200% uh, of GDP. Today, it's 96 trillion. Yeah. Okay. In other words, they have kept interest rates so low. They've suppressed, uh, you know, uh, they've had such deep and long-lasting financial uh, repression that the economy has become a giant LBO. Yeah. Okay, and when you do an LBO, I was in the private equity business, so I know. When you do an LBO, there can be prosperity for a couple years. <laughs> and, but if things don't work out right, uh, you're going to have uh, interest payments that begin uh, right. to and become And we're starting to see that interest yeah. as yeah. a percentage of the federal budget. Well, yeah, et cetera, the, uh, for years, the uh, interest on the federal debt was like two or three hundred billion. It is now the run rate in the last few uh, months has been a trillion. Okay, and it's heading to much bigger. To bring it back to Trump's specific policies, uh, you know, what uh, he came into office saying he was not only going to stop illegal immigration, but he was going to cut legal immigration in half. What is bad about that? Why is that part of a war on capitalism? Okay, because uh, essentially it raises a whole issue of supply side policy. And I was a supply sider back in the 1980s with Reagan, and then I got run out of the supply side church because I didn't follow all the precepts uh, exactly. But the issue that we have today uh, as to why growth has been so tepid and why living standards have sort of stagnated and why there's so many uh, very um, alienated people out there in the flyover America wanting to get behind Trump uh, uh, you know, the, the reason uh, that uh, th this has been uh, happening um, is because we've got huge deficiencies on the supply side of our economy in terms of labor and capital investment. Now, the native-born workforce is actually shrinking. It peaked in 2015, and it's shrinking. And that's because, for better or worse, or for whatever reasons we can get into huge cultural discussions here, uh, uh, native-born uh, women and families are not having babies. And so our labor force is shrinking. And since historically half of economic growth, GDP growth, has been labor, the other half is productivity, um, our economy is grinding to a halt because the labor supply is shrinking unless we allow uh, immigrants who want to work to come here and become part of the workforce. Now, this is how we got where we were at the peak of things. And I, I, I got a number that I think is uh, kind of startling when you hear about the flood of immigrants coming in and we're being overrun and uh, America's being, uh, you know, somehow turned upside down. If you go to 1870, we finally got out of the, the uh, Civil War and all the chaos that that uh, generated. There were only 39 people, 39 million people left in America, <laughs> north, south, all the states, the Union reunited. Uh, over the next... Um, 40 years to the eve of World War I, we had 25 million immigrants. So uh, relative to the population in 1870, uh, the immigrant population in a few decades was uh, two-thirds of the population that you begin with. Now, how many immigrants do we have today? We have legal immigrants of about a million, a little over a million. We have a population of 328 uh, million people, 335 million people. So immigration today is less than one third of 1%, not 66% or 60% or 40%. In a, in a given year. Pardon? In a given year. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, even in uh, if we right. take 10 or 20 years, it's still mm -hmm. a couple percent. So that's the first point. The second point is we have a totally broken, ridiculous uh, immigration policy that comes right out of the swamp in Washington, and that if Trump really understood what he was saying when he said, I'm going to drain the swamp, the first thing you would do would be to change the basis for immigration 
from, you, to get here, you either have to be, uh, you know, a family unification, which is about 400,000 out of the million, or you have to be a PhD or some uh, tech, uh, high tech uh, uh, skilled uh, worker to get a couple hundred thousand more slots, or, and this is the big or, you have to be a refugee or an asylee. And that's the only way that unskilled workers can get into the United States today when we desperately need unskilled and low-skilled worker because our native workforce is declining. Last year, in the last year that the data is available, uh, 2022, only 4,000 green cards were issued under the category, I think it's called E3 and E6, uh, for unskilled workers. 4,000. Out of the 1,118,000 legal immigrants that got here, to say nothing of the hordes that are on the border. Now, the hordes on the border, if you look at the, uh, you know, if you can stand it, you look at Fox News every night, uh, you know, most of them are pretty uh, strong-backed, able-bodied uh, young people and their families are middle-aged, but it's, it's a unskilled, low-skilled workforce looking for a job and a better economic opportunity, but it's, the policy is equivalent, and I wrote about this in my uh, blog the other day, it's equivalent to try the, trying to drive a dump truck through a pinhole. In other words, there's millions of people at the border trying to come in. There's only 4,000 slots for unskilled workers, so all of them are at the border being forced to pretend that they're asylees, that they're refugees, and the only way you can become a refugee is to cross the border, break the law, get arrested, and then uh, be put into the queue that takes months and months, in fact, years uh, of determination in a totally clogged up court system uh, in order to uh, get certified that you're a asyl asylum seeker. And to prove that, you have to prove, uh, for instance, <coughs> that if you come from Co uh, Costa Rica, as an example, uh, you're uh, in uh, endangerment of life and limb if you stayed. Uh, I bring up Costa Rica because um, I checked the other day, uh, a couple of my family members were down there on vacation, seems to be the hot spot, uh, and it turns out you can get a ticket from Costa Rica to Kansas City if there were some job openings there for $214 on Delta, okay? Um, yeah, so if we had a guest worker program of the kind that makes so much sense today that would allow people to go to the U.S. consulate in Costa Rica, uh, get a guest worker permit and be matched up with someone looking uh, to have uh, hire people for lawn care work or warehouse work in Kansas City, they could get there for $214, no fuss, no muss, uh, you know, no uh, chaos at the border, uh, no, uh, uh, you know, uh, border patrol uh, people uh, chasing them around in the middle of the night, uh, and we would open up that little pinhole uh, to the economic rationality uh, that we need to have. In other words, if they simply reform the system to, ba to make it economics-based, rather than asylum-based, which is politics, make it economics-based, and you have a guest worker program, and if people come here and they, they're making a payroll and uh, their employer is certifying it month after month, year after year, uh, for 10 years, I'd say give them a citizenship and let them stay and, stay, and the whole problem would be solved. The hordes at the border are millions of people that want to be economic immigrants that are being forced to be political refugees and they're creating a mass. And the reason I mentioned the $214 uh, Delta ticket is you got to, to get from Costa Rica to the uh, Rio Grande, you got to pay uh, the coyote $4,000 to $10,000 to get you there when Delta would be happy to do it for 214 if we were only smart enough to have a rational economics-based uh, immigration system. But there you go again. Immigration control, the uh, whole Byzantine convoluted uh, uh, control system is statism at its worst. 
It's run by uh, the lobbies in Washington. Google gets everybody they want. They get all the PhDs. They get all the smart young techies coming out of, uh, you know, South Korea or Taiwan or wherever else they're coming from. Uh, they, they take care of their needs. The Fortune 500 takes care of their needs because there's four or five categories for advanced degrees, PhDs, unusual uh, skills, blah, blah, blah. They all get in three or 400,000 a year. But employers that need to have people working uh, in fast food joints uh, or in uh, lawn care businesses or in warehouses or in agriculture can't get anybody here uh, legally. So you get the whole mess that we have today. Um, I've got uh, one more question before we go to uh, the audience. Um, so you, in, in the book, Trump's War on Capitalism, you also you talk about how he, uh, Trump, who you, you define as a Caesarist politician. He's like Caesar, uh, very imperial in that sense. He overreacted to COVID, both in terms of lockdowns and signing off on that, but also giving people lots of money not to work, which, you know, Lord knows I want to be in that situation someday, but it's probably not good public policy. Um, defense spending, he's a big advocate of more and more defense spending, regardless of uh, the actual threat to the uh, uh, national security or our borders. But my question for you before we go to the audience is, so Trump is awful. I, I can't speak for this audience. I know for myself, I didn't vote for Trump. I don't expect to vote for Trump. I'm not moving to Canada and I'm not moving to Cuba if he wins or anything like that. But who, isn't the other alternative as bad or worse if, ah. because it's gonna be Joe Biden? Yeah. Uh, and or right. is this just this way you have like your next book half written already, right? right? Yeah. Where it's like Biden's yeah. war. My, yeah. Well, well, first of all, uh, if you have to suffer through another Democratic administration, might as well have a senile uh, guy uh, in the chair uh, because uh, very little is going to get done. But uh, that's a, a little uh, facetious. But we have to start thinking, I think, from our uh, point of view in the world, that four years is not the end of history. And that if we don't get a non-statist or an anti-statist party reassembled, realigned out of the mess of the uniparty that we have today, well then there really is no hope because uh, you, know, you will continue to do the same old thing over and over again, uh, which uh, Einstein said you know, is the perfect uh, definition of insanity. So I say, um, what we need to do in 2024 is blow up the Republican Party. It needs to be purged. It is a gang of, you know, uh, cultural uh, right-wingers, uh, neocon warmongers, and basically uh, careerist politicians who use the party as a fundraising Do you mechanism. still consider yourself a Republican? Uh, well, I, you know, I, I think... No, this party, this party needs to go. Okay, and, you know this is a libertarian audience uh, broadly. So explain quickly to you. You talked about social conservatives and th stuff like that. In the book, you mentioned you know the drug war is stupid. Can you just give us ten seconds on that? What's the Zapruder I'll, I'll film you, version I'll, of uh, why the drug yeah, war? I'll is give bad. you three seconds. The drug war is really goddamn stupid, <laughs> okay? Uh, and, and again, this is part of the whole Trump shtick. You know, he came down the escalator in 2015 talking about the uh, murders and the rapists and the drug dealers uh, coming across the border. As I lay out in my book quite clearly, if the drug part of it is a problem, uh, you know, uh, deregulate uh, drugs and uh, let uh, the Teamsters ship the stuff in and let Philip Morris distribute, uh, keep it uh, legal you know, above board. Uh, I think they're, they might even be post Altria now. Oh, uh, they're Altria. on like their 10th name change. Yeah, I know. Yes. Well, the old Philip Morris. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, bring it above ground, make it legal, uh, take out all the uh, premium profit that basically goes to funding the criminal organizations that are necessitated when the government decrees that a, a desired product shall be artificially scarce. So, the, you know, that's part of the, all the rhetoric, too. I mean, everything you hear about all the drugs coming across, um, you know, that is a different issue. 
and we need to separate them out, uh, the economics of immigration versus the economics of uh, the stupid uh, war on drugs and the drug control uh, laws that we have. Um, and, uh, you know, the fact that until, uh, people don't probably remember this, I don't think any of us could, we are not been around long enough, but until 1918, you didn't have to have a passport to come to America. Okay, there was no passports. There were no I like to blame my parents for that change. <laughs> Once they got in, they're like, okay, this, this isn't working. No, I mean, all, all of this, uh, you know, uh, immigration control uh, really uh, uh, began uh, then, and it's created its own, uh, you know, its own bureaucracy and its own uh, set of politics. So if we got back to sort of economically driven border policy, which is what we had to our great benefit until uh, 2023 or, or 1923 when they passed the first Immigration Act. Uh, uh, half of the, most of this problem would go away. But even if we did, and I had a little thing about this the other day, I was sort of about maps. And I said, hey, you know, uh, this terrible thing that's going on right now, they're trying to get 60 billion more for this you know, utter uh, insanity of the Ukraine proxy war, and they're tying it to 15 uh, billion of more border control money for the right-wing Republicans so that somehow the, uh, you know, uniparty uh, can scrape together the money it needs to keep the forever wars going <laughs> in Ukraine. So I said, well, let's look at some of the maps, and most of it's about Ukraine. We won't get into that now, but I said, here's a map. Uh, it's a map of Mexico and where the U.S. consulates are located. And there's actually 10 of them, and they're spread all over Mexico. And I said, could you imagine what would happen to the crowd at the border if you were allowed to go to the consulate or embassy in your area and apply for a guest worker permit, just like you can do now, uh, to get a visa if you're a skilled worker or to get a visa if you're the, uh, the wife of an American citizen uh, who got stranded in Argentina some way. Uh, if, we could, if we used this massive expense, and most of it I think is a waste, of our State Department and all of our embassies and all of the councils we'd have everywhere, if we put those bureaucrats to useful work, which would be to interview and vet people who wanted to get a guest worker permit and also make it possible for them to connect digitally or otherwise in this modern world with employers or their agents in Kansas City or Spokane or Detroit, Michigan. Um, what would happen to the um, you know, 300,000 a month or whatever encounters they're having at the border? Well, my answer is it'd probably go down to about 5,000 a month and it would be who would be left? Well, drug dealers, criminals, and insane people, uh, as uh, you know, uh, Trump's always talking about. So, 95% of the business at the, in terms of the hordes at the border, would disappear because they would be handled. Not and just Mexico is one example. They would be handled by the U.S. consulate uh, system all over Central America, uh, Latin America, and elsewhere in the world. Uh, let's go to audience question. Um, why don't we, uh, Morgan, can you uh, go back here to uh, Daniel? And uh, please just ask a question. Sure. Uh, you mentioned when you were talking about the monetary system and economics, how you thought some libertarians were too focused uh, on issues not related to the monetary system. But don't you think you are committing the same mistake but in the opposite direction of blaming everything that's happened negatively economically in the US on the Federal Reserve and on the monetary system? Isn't the decline of some industries and a lot of economic changes that have happened in the US simply a fault of relative changes in population, productivity, comparative advantage around the world and evolution since World War II? Uh, yeah, there, I mean, I'm saying it's not the only thing going on, but the, the honest to goodness fact is it is the main thing going on that is shifting the location of economic activity. Yeah, technology changes, but if we weren't inflating uh, the domestic wage cost price structure and we had investment that we need, 
the technology change would not cause business industrial activity or business activity to migrate to Mexico if they're assembling cars or to China if they're making uh, you know, uh, computers or uh, Apple products. That wouldn't happen, it could happen here. But the two things that we have, and I was getting into that, is we have a constricted supply side. One, because uh, uh, we don't have the labor. Two, because we have the inflation that has caused an export of our industrial base. And three, because there's so much speculation generated by easy money and all the money printing by the Fed um, that uh, we're not getting domestic investment uh, in technology, plant, equipment, uh, workforce uh, upgrades and so forth that would allow us to remain competitive. And I'll give you one number that I think, uh, again, it's uh, part of the indictment of the Trump era. From about 1955 to 2000, the um, average rate of net business investment, net real business investment. Now, every part of that phrase is important. Real, because you take the inflation out of the numbers, and net, because if you're simply replacing the capital stock you're consuming this year, that is depreciation and amortization, that doesn't get you anywhere, that just keeps you where you are. But the net numbers that the uh, Commerce Department publishes are after depre uh, our gross capital investment after depreciation, after uh, amortization, and after inflation. The number during the Trump uh, four years was three-tenths of 1%. Not 1%, 3%, or 5%, uh, as it was historically, but it was 0.3. So uh, essentially 1 15th of what the historical norm was. So what we got during the Trump four or five years is a vicious anti-supply side program. Anti-supply of labor, anti-supply of competitive goods uh, from abroad, and anti-supply in terms of investment in productive plant and equipment. Trump was, you know, boasting all the time about the stock market being sky high. But that was because all of the capital in the system was being diverted to speculation on Wall Street financial engineering. If you look at the increase in stock buybacks, if you look at the increase in dividends earned and unearned, if you look at the massive uh, uh, explosion of M&A activity, most of it totally unproductive, just putting companies together and then they take them apart four years later and both of them are claimed to be in the shareholder's interest. If you got the, the financial engineering out of the system, the capital would be flowing uh, to uh, productive investment. But it's not because of the Federal Reserve. Therefore, too much speculation and financial engineering too little investment, and then because of import policy and immigration policy, uh, too little uh, uh, labor to make goods here, and then we're even taxing uh, consumers for the goods that we're uh, required to uh, Let's, buy. Let's uh, go to a question up here. Oh, hold on. I'm sorry. I was actually uh, pointing hi, behind hi, you. Let's, hi there. My let name's uh, Brooke, and, and in 1990, I went to Japan to run a trading desk for Merrill Lynch. And the thing that I observed, um, back then it was Japan, not China, right, that was eating our lunch, sure. was how easy it was for us to move capital into Japan. Yeah. And yet, labor couldn't move into Japan. And it was hard to get capital out of Japan. You could get profits out maybe, but not capital. You could put IP. And I think what you're saying is that really, labor has to have freedom to, of motion first. Right. And then capital can follow. And I agree with that. So here's my theoretical question, and I'm looking forward to this, right? Because ever since, and I think it was under Carter, we, uh, not Carter, um, Clinton, we have, we, we've made it uh, student debt impossible to discharge in bankruptcy. Yeah. Now, what if uh, China, Europe, Japan, the rest of the world just said, look, it's not a crime to discharge student debt in bankruptcy. If you're an American, come here. You can't be extradited, right? So we lose all of our native, because I, I see, you know, you, you, 
I have a border in, you know, I rent a room to a, to a 55-year-old who's working as a night nurse to pay off student loans. Oh, my God, yeah. So she can eventually not die, right? And I'm like... Yeah, I think there's probably a bigger story there than... Uh, no, there loan. isn't. And You're talking you to somebody have who, who... You have you a history of doing wisely. that. Well, you know, know, but that's on, the, not true. on the point about this guy, it, who's, it, your yeah. guy who's still working... And I didn't say what the gender was, okay. nor mine. So, um, the... But but I think that that's a way for the market to actually adjust, because if these countries actually do that, we're going to have to face the fact that we're doing the wrong thing, which well, I think I, is what we're talking about. I couldn't about. agree more. And, and about your guy who's working, is, you know, there's actually several million people on Social Security who are in danger of having their Social Security tech check garnished because they're behind on their student loan repayments, okay? And some of them are never going to make it. Now, the bigger point I'm making is that uh, the $1.8 trillion or whatever the number is now that has been pumped into the system for uh, student loans since the 1990s when the thing really took off is basically subtracting labor supply from our economy because people become perpetual students. They really do. And as long as you're in student status, you don't have to service uh, or pay back your loan. And so uh, one of the numbers that I looked at, I look at uh, is, uh, and without getting buried in it right now, we, I look at the real unemployment rate in America. And the way I get it is I take the uh, total adult population, let's say 18 to 70, and I calculate the hours at a standard work year, 2,000 hours a year, and I get a, a number, and then I look at the number that the Labor Department says, labor hours, they can actually track this, that are being used and the, uh, today in our economy, and the answer is the unemployment rate on an hours basis for the total population, forget about whether the BLS says they're in the labor force or not in the labor force, uh, forget whether they're on disability because they got a, 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 a corporal tunnel right. problem with their uh, left finger. Uh, forget about whether there are students at 35 still working on their second PhD. If you just take it on, on an hour's basis for the total society, because people ought to work and support themselves, the unemployment rate is 40 percent. And the 40 percent unemployment rate is a, a function of welfare state policies that subtract uh, that delete labor supply from the market because you get a student loan or you're getting the whole package of welfare benefits or you're getting early retirement under Social Security, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So half of the problem that we have to deal with here is a kind of welfare state blob that is drastically undermining the supply side of the economy by causing huge speculation and financial engineering to dissipate capital on Wall Street and driving labor out of productive employment on Main Street. And when you have capital uh, that's uh, uh, being uh, depleted and when you have labor that's being depleted and shrunk, then you don't have a good recipe for prosperity uh, and you, you have another you, you have another picture, you have another part of the analysis as to why statism is ultimately uh, the problem uh, that we're dealing with. Uh, a question, sir. <laughs> yes. Uh, first, as, as one who greatly applauds your main concerns, uh, strategically, I believe that it's, I, that it's true that you want us all to vote for RFK Junior, uh, and absolutely. Despite, yeah. despite RFK, the fact, RFK Senior is not available. <laughs> yeah, because he's not. Available. Despite the fact that he's daft on the subject of climate change, could you outline that brilliant strategy of why we've got to vote for that guy? Okay, that's that's where we were getting all yeah, night, and all right. I never and got there. Slowly um, we turn. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I just to put it a little biographical, the first campaign I worked on is an anti-war SDS student protester in 1968 was RFK's candidacy for the presidency on the ground that he wanted to bring the MP 
Empire home, uh, and he was the anti-war candidate. So here we have uh, RFK Jr., and we have the same uh, problem, only far worse today. But my uh, reason for supporting him is that the beginning of uh, addressing all of this means you've got to have a tough, skeptical uh, attitude to the Fed, and he does. I'm advising him privately on a lot of things, and I know from conversations that he does. And second, you have to understand, we don't need a $900 billion defense budget, a $1.3 trillion total national security budget, if you count everything, and we need to drastically uh, re rein in uh, the empire and all the bases does and all the Does he share your um, vision of uh, you know, free trade and uh, free movement of people? Uh, I think uh, he's uh, not, you know, he's not yeah. where he needs to be on everything, yeah. but, uh, yeah. uh, you yeah. know, I, I think you have to start with the fiscal monstrosity that we have and recognize there's a two-step thing to deal with it. One is defense. We should cut that by four or five hundred billion. You know, when uh, Eisenhower said... Uh, warned about the military industrial complex everybody knows that speech he gave in 1961 when he was leaving if you put the defense budget of that day which was at the peak of the cold war the height of the you know, soviet union actually was functioning still at the time uh, that number would be about 400 billion today in current dollars of purchasing power and ike said that's enough in fact he said uh, you know the danger is we're going to spend too much and if anybody knew about war and anybody knew about uh, really uh, understood defense uh, president eisenhower did the budget today is 900 billion and the same dollars of purchasing power and we don't have a um, you know, uh, industrial state, uh, technologically empowered uh, enemy uh, like we had then. You know, the GDP of Russia is two trillion, ours is 26 trillion. The GDP of China is 15 trillion, ours is 26. But China would, you know, collapse in six months if their exports were cut mm -hmm. off. So they're not going to. Uh, just briefly, where where do you uh, both parties? You you know, you pointed out everybody believes in more defense spending. Uh, I think everybody understands the existential threats to the United States are, have not been growing. You know, what explains that kind of, you know, the willingness of either the Democrats or the Republicans to just keep goosing? Well, I, I think at the end of the day, it's the military industrial complex and the fact that the defense budget is like a self-licking ice cream cone. OK, uh, there is so much money dripping off the sides of the cone. Uh, going into the uh, think tanks and the NGOs and the whole apparatus of Washington that then comes up constantly uh, with reasons for more, with uh, threat assessments that are total baloney. I mean, you know, really, what, what is the threat from Russia to the United States today? And if it's a threat to Germany, uh, then the Germans can arm themselves. And they basically were spending 1.3% of GDP and buying their gas uh, until we convinced them to join the Ukraine proxy war because they didn't think it was a threat. OK, so uh, the, the point is, uh, going back to the question about RFK, you've got to bring the empire home. You, if you take the 400. 300, 400, 500 billion out of defense, uh, and then stop all the interventions. Because remember, we're spending 350 billion a year on veterans alone, and that's just the deferred cost of war. Uh, all these people that uh, come home and uh, they're permanently disabled or uh, economically disabled, we have to support them medically, uh, income-wise, and so forth. But that's a cost that ought to be charged to the defense budget, and it isn't. So uh, you have to bring that home, and if we do that, then I think you can start to piece together some other things. Uh, I do not think, from my conversations, that RFK would be opposed to a stronger means test on Social Security and Medicare for people that really, sh you know, with 100,000, 300,000, a million, 10 million of income, should be getting it. Uh, and so that would help in a big way, because when you think about how much we're spending, on those two programs alone, something like 20 trillion over the next uh, 10 years, uh, if you put a means test at the top of the income scale, 
you would take uh, you would uh, take a lot out of well, that. We really have left the supply side church, right? Yeah. So now it's cutting government spending really is more important than reducing taxes. Well, at the end yeah. of the day, that's where Milton was uh, Friedman was right. He said uh, the ultimate measure of you know uh, the government uh, problem is the spending level and uh, that's another beef I have with Trump, uh, you know, at the peak in 2020. And we didn't get into it a lot, and I wish we could have, but it's in the book. Uh, when, it, when he went into the whole lockdown and then they bailed out uh, everything with these massive stimulus bills, spending uh, reached, uh, you know, 40% uh, of GDP uh, at the federal, state, and local level. That's European social democracy level. Yeah, I mean, uh, FDI... Trump between 2019, the budget uh, federal spending was 4.4 trillion. In 2020, it was 6.6. .6. In 2021, 6.8. Yeah. So that's yeah. a massive increase. Yeah, uh, and that's just the time. federal level, but right. also, you know, there was so much bait being put on the table to the states. If you, uh, you know, expand your Medicaid, we'll give you more matching. So you really have to look at the federal, state, uh, local, uh, the public sector. Okay, and it did reach 40 uh, trillion, I mean 40% of GDP. Another way to look at it is uh, the, the worst kind of spending we do, even though it's socially necessary and why it needs to be constantly, uh, you know, c contained, c constrained, is transfer payments. And on the eve of the COVID lockdowns, which were totally unnecessary, uh, the transfer payment rate, and the they publish this every month, of, federal uh, agencies was 3.1 trillion, which is money that was flushing uh, in from either borrowed or taxes, flushing into Social Security, Medicare, food stamps, housing, all the rest of it at all levels of government. Uh, when they passed the CARES Act and Trump uh, said, you know, cash is on the way, relief is on the way, by April 2020, the transfer payment rate had gone from a steady state of about 3.1 trillion to 6.6 .6 trillion, and then uh, in December, Trump decide, uh, you know signed a, a second installment uh, of the COVID relief, and uh, in the campaign uh, said we've got to give everybody another $2,000 per uh, person check, uh, which uh, most of it was paid for in the third installment, which Biden happened to sign, and uh, he called it, uh, you know, the American Rescue Act or whatever, but it was simply the last installment of the Trump COVID relief bailout free stuff. The reason I mention it is that when that became effective in the spring of 2021, the transfer payment rate from government in America rose to 8.1 trillion at an annual rate. In other words, from three to eight. And so the difference, the five trillion difference, and they wonder why we have inflation? Yeah. Because all the transfer payments weren't even buying public works. Uh, they weren't, you know, they weren't buying anything. They were simply money that was being uh, basically extracted uh, from future taxpayers and printed uh, by the uh, Fed. Uh, uh, you know, slushed into the economy uh, to create, you know, the, these numbers, I think, can, at some point, uh, you know, you can start to uh, lose patience with them. But the, the point I'm trying to make is what happened during 2019, 2020, 2021 is out of this world. It's off the, the historic economic and fiscal radar screen. And all of it generated because Trump had no principles. And Dr. Fauci comes to him and says, you know, the pandemic is at hand. Uh, we need to lock down the economy, close the schools, shut down the restaurants and bars and malls and so forth. And Trump said, OK, let's do it. And uh, we were off to the races. That, that was an unforgivable sin. Okay, I'm mainly trying to do analysis here, but when it comes to preaching <laughs> at the end of the night, the unpardonable sin, the unforgivable sin was the whole COVID uh, lockdown uh, policy. And, the, and, and I buy very strongly here the Harry Truman doctrine. He had the plaque on his desk. It said the buck stops here. Uh, all of that happened because uh, Trump uh, embraced it, endorsed it, tolerated it uh, and uh, let it happen. I can't believe that anyone who was even a kind of milquetoast 
um, you know, uh, Republican. Uh, what, what do they call the... Uh, Rhinos? The, rhino, yeah. I was Anyone who was even a milk toast rhino would have thought, you know, we're going to destroy the business of millions of people that have been working for decades, building up uh, their local restaurant or... Uh, uh, a gym or whatever else it might have been, and we're just going to shut them down and destroy them. We're going to tell people that they can't go to the mall, even if they're healthy. They can't go to a gym if they're 25-year-old weightlifter. Uh, you know, a, a even a uh, as I said in the book, a half-assed Republican would have said, "Wait a minute, we, we can't we can't do that." And Trump basically, and this is, goes to your point, Nick, uh, he's a Caesarian, and by that he thinks the great man on the horseback or sitting in the, behind the resolute desk is going to make a whole, the whole difference. Uh, he's the guy that can negotiate. He's the guy that can sit down with, you know, uh, the leader of Korea or China or whatever. And that is, that's the danger. Yeah. Uh, we've got time for one last question. Yes. Okay. One of the offsetting factors of all this regulation and spending has always been the underground economy very much depended upon cash, and we're seeing less and less cash. So a underground economy still exists. Is it going to grow, or is are we going to lose it? And then also the other thing is we've got all these immigrants coming in this country. What are they all doing? Well, I think most of them, if they were, if it, they were legal and they were given a guest worker permit, would be working. That's why they're coming here, okay? But since they, uh, that's illegal and they have, they, if, if you go uh, across the border, get arrested, get in the queue for an asylee, asylum uh, determination, you're not allowed to work for six months, period. And if something's wrong with your paperwork after six months and you're still waiting in the queue, which almost all of them are, you still can't work. Okay, so we're basically making it impossible. But if you're a blue state uh, city or a blue state governor, uh, what you're doing is opening up the hotels and opening up the uh, soup kitchens and everything else uh, for the people who are coming here who are not allowed to work because it's against the law. It's so damn stupid and crazy that you have to wonder how, uh, how you know, people can uh, really uh, not understand what's going on. But that, that's, the, that's where I think we are. Yeah, yeah do you think, uh, yeah. Well, is the underground economy um, growing, shrinking? Will it become more difficult to do in a world of uh, yeah. you know, kind of technology-enabled well, or central bank-enabled surveillance? Yeah, I think uh, the, mo the most dangerous thing that anybody's talking about at the present time is abolishing cash. And of course, uh, when you hear people talking about uh, uh, government uh, digital currency or uh, the need to get rid of cash, there was a big movement on a while ago uh, from all the Keynesians, Keynesian economists who said, we got to get rid of cash because that's the only way we can you know, fine tune the GDP uh, if we uh, don't allow cash to, to flush through the system and uh, behave in ways that we uh, don't approve. So uh, the campaign uh, to abolish cash or to replace it with digital uh, uh, cash, which isn't at all uh, the same thing, uh, you know, dollar, dollars that are in all our pockets here are bearer currency. Your name isn't on it, your social security number isn't on it, but it's accepted uh, as hand-to-hand uh, -hand, uh, uh, money because uh, that's what we all uh, understand. You get rid of that, the underground economy uh, practically disappears, and the powers that be say, well, we're doing this to get rid of all the bad things like terrorists and drug dealers. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know that the terrorists are using that much uh, cash and, uh, you know, the drug dealers... Yeah, I, I understand it. they like the Discover card because yeah. it has, you know, really good <laughs> yeah, you well, know, features, uh, they low don't. interest rates. Yeah. Um, um, can I ask, just to wrap things up, you know, the book is Trump's War on Capitalism. I highly recommend it. It has a foreword by RFK Jr., who, like Trump and Biden, I will not be voting for, but I appreciate your making the case. Your career is kind of, as you, you were pointing out, has done this kind of remarkable circuit where, you know, when you were in the 60s, when you were uh, younger and beginning your career, you 
were pushing for you know an end to the Pentagon or a critique of that, a critique of what used to be called the welfare warfare state, um, and you've come back to that. I, my question, and you, you in the book, and I think tonight you've made really strong cases about why things are so kind of, you know, screwed up and everything. But are we living in a better world than we were in 1968, materially and kind of morally and just on a day-to-day -day basis? And if so, how do you account for that? Capitalism. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is the one thing you get whenever you point out what's wrong with the state-driven policy and, you know, the Fed and the deficits and trade policy and so forth. Well, you're better off now than you were 20, 30 years ago. But it wasn't because of the state intervention. It was despite the state intervention. In other words, capitalism is dynamic. People want to improve their circumstances. They invent things. They create enterprise. They find better mousetraps. All of that continues, and that's what keeps the economy crawling forward, inching higher. Uh, but what, what the problem is, is when the state gets too big, too strong, uh, too, um, you, you know, uh, too, too interventionist, it slows that down. In fact, uh, it maybe even slows it to a crawl. So uh, yeah, we've, we're, we're clearly better off materially. I don't know if we're better off morally, okay? But we're clearly better off materially because that's what capitalism does. And the thing is, you can't allow the politicians to claim credit for what is happening silently day in and day out uh, through the length length and breadth uh, of a market economy that's now 26 uh, trillion big and you know 100 trillion worldwide all right we're going to leave it there david stockman thanks for talking to reason thank you, thank you.